15 seconds, guidance internal, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, engines on, 5, 4, 3, Ray Alonso from the Draper Labs. Right. Let's start with the Apollo. Okay. Oh, well, welcome and good morning and all that. It's, uh, I'd like to go back to the beginning before the beginning. Uh, I joined Draper Labs in, what, 1957. And uh, at the time, the man who hired me was a man, is a man called Hal Lanning, an extremely bright man, who was Eldon's boss, and Eldon was my boss. And uh, as Eldon was very busy with, with uh, Polaris, and uh, I was not being very helpful to him, seeing as my engineering skills were minimal, uh, he, he had said, OK, you go play with Hal Lanning. And Hal Lanning and I decided that there was a, a, uh, something, well, he had an idea to go to Mars. And for that, he needed a computer that was very, very minimal, uh, in the sense that it certainly had to have very low power consumption. Uh, and, of course, it had to last a long time and all that. Uh, and the things that were made this possible, the whole idea possible, was the fact that this computer didn't have to do very much for 99% of the time, and it would only have to do something uh, at certain critical points in the flight. So uh, the, the, there was a proposal to go to Mars, which didn't go any place then, as, as now. And uh, the... Uh, uh, so we developed a computer, designed a computer, which was the forerunner of the AGC. And uh, Hubler Smith, uh, well, it was called the Christmas computer because it was going to get done uh, in time for Christmas. And it's, soon enough, it became unclear as to which Christmas. But the, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, the thing was that this computer uh, used a core rope. I had found, I would read somewhere about this thing called the Australian rope, and it seemed like a good idea. Uh, you could put information in it, and it wouldn't go away. Uh, we, uh, Al Hopkins and I uh, developed a scheme called core transistor logic, which would maintain states. And you could shut the computer down and, 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 res and, and uh, with zero power consumption and make it come up again and all things like that. So now this machine had uh, a 3-bit opcode and a 12-bit word length. So. Uh, when Apollo came, and of course the, the Mars thing went away, but when Apollo came, we used the ideas from this computer uh, to design the AGC. Now, what I'm we'll talking about now is, is five things which, in my opinion, were good ideas. They really made the, the success of the Apollo guidance computer possible, and they were evolutionary dead ends. They didn't go anyplace. And we'll start with, uh, with a core rope. Uh, I doubt, you know, this, we can put the... Okay, we'll go there. Well, the, the core rope, uh, uh, the schematic is the same one you've seen before. Let's go to the next one. Uh, and now I will show you what we used in this Mars computer. And the point of showing this particular slide is that you can see what it would take to make this core rope. You have to get, you know, get the little thread and needle and pass this wire through the inside of a core if you want a one and, and miss it if you want a zero. And when you're all done, you still have the problem of selecting the one core and making it switch. Now, these are nonlinear cores. Uh, they have a hysteresis loop. Uh, they don't have as much coercive force as, as the ferrite co uh, cores, uh, which means that you could use less power in order to do it. But still, you had to do a certain amount of circuitry to make the whole thing work. Uh, now, go to the next one, please. One of the things that I think is, was essential to uh, the uh, success of Apollo was this absolutely brilliant, in my opinion, invention by a man called Sam Francis of Sipican uh, uh, how to make this core rope. Because the way I thought of making them was you put the cores in a line and you take the needle and you go in and out. Well, uh, Sam Francis thought of putting it on the side. So this is a XY table which moves the 
uh, the cores are all put flat okay on, on that uh, uh, frame you see there and the little white circle where the lady is pushing the wire through is, is stationary and what moves is the frame up and down sideways and so forth and then a punch paper tape has the uh, a program that says okay you'll pass the wire through this one or pass the wire through this other place so this was uh, how to wire around with no mistakes and I when I heard of this thing I said that is absolutely great so now as I said, this is one evolutionary dead end because I haven't heard of any computers using a core rope since Apollo on that. Now, we wanted to make a, um, uh, because manufacturing core rope was kind of a, a problem, uh, we uh, had another idea, which again, never saw the light of day, but uh, it was interesting just because of what it used. Let's go to the next one. So what if we could make the, uh, the, this, this rope uh, by preforming the wires and then putting the, the the magnetic uh, circuit around it. In other words, uh, make it as if without the cores and then put the cores in. And you can see how this goes. If you make this thing which we call the braid, and that, 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 that black stuff is the, that would be all the wires, and then you take these pieces of ferrite, the U-shaped ones, and then you put the little uh, cross piece on top to close the magnetic field. And the thing was, how can we make it? Ah. Well, this problem had been solved 200 years ago. Uh, a man called Vaucanson in France invented the loom and Jacquard made the Jacquard loom. And the interesting thing, I found out that when Jacquard ma started making these looms for making cloth, the weaving cloth, that from 1802 to 1804, he sold 10,000 of them in Europe. It was incredible. So uh, the idea is that you, you, you took spools of wire with feeders, and then you had the, uh, just like you would with, with cloth that you would uh, uh, make a pattern on and separate them between the ones and the zeros, and you put a temporary uh, separator in there, and you form this braid. And so, next slide, please. Uh, uh. So, uh, there being enough money in those days, uh, I went and uh, I think, I don't know how upset you were about this. I don't recall your being, uh, uh, you know, because you thought, hey, she's not bothering me, therefore. I right. So anyway, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I wasn't in Eldon's here. Uh, anyway, so I, I bought, we bought this, uh, this, this loom, which made by some outfit. This is unchanged, basically, from, from uh, 150 years ago. Uh, only at the time, the loom was being driven by uh, punch paper cards, uh, which were all in a string, and the rods would be pushed in and out, depending on whether the punch paper cards had a hole or not. So we replaced that with a tape-driven machine and air cylinders. But we, we then... Uh, you can see down in here the uh, the the wefts. I forget now what they're called. The, the the things that pull the wires in and out. And I'll put point over here. And the braid would get made uh, on these temporary uh, Teflon covered uh, nails. And then when the whole thing was made, we pot it and make the, the entire memory. Uh, now this is just because I, th I thought again this was a neat thing. Uh, we never flew one. We never we made some. Uh, they were quite dense actually. It was, they were even denser than the ones that uh, flew in Apollo. But that was a a, 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 a good historical point. So we can shut it down. That's it. Well, as I said, the uh, uh, the core rope is is no more in terms of uh, a place in in, the, in computers. So that's one of the things that, uh, evolu from an evolutionary point of view, went away. Uh, okay. The second thing I'd like to mention is is direct memory access, uh, at least from the point of view of getting in, uh, input uh, data, uh, inputting data into the computer. Now, DMA. Uh, we actually, in that little Mars computer, we, uh, Hal Lanning and I had uh, uh, thought of uh, a way of, of getting incremental data into specific registers in a way that the program didn't have to worry about. The normal idea of interrupt was, well, you have to stop, you have to put all the central registers away, you have to call a subroutine, you've got to then go and, 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 and look at some special circuit that's going to read the input or, the out, or, or write the output, and then you uh, put everything up put Humpty Dumpty back together again and continue with your program. Uh, and uh, what we thought is, how about 
cutting through all this stuff and just having something whereby the pulse comes in. Uh, a specific register is either incremented or decremented, and the computer is, is interrupted, uh, certainly, because all you have to do is put away the accumulator and just bring in this register and increment or decrement and put it back. But the, the program doesn't ever know that this is happening. So as far as the program is concerned, this particular register always has the right IMU angle, and this other one has always has the right velocity and, and things like that. So that was pretty good, we thought, on, on it. Uh, in fact, it was so good that at the time uh, we had uh, somewhat of a contest with the uh, IBM Federal Systems Division because they wanted to take our lunch away uh, and, and, and put their own box in. And uh, they, looking for faults in our computer, came up with the fact that what we were doing was cycle stealing. And I thought the cycle, that was a great, great name. I really uh, admired that in terms of, of propaganda. So, so that was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, so now DNA still exists, certainly. So I think that that's the the uh, now Hal Lanning and I actually got a patent on that. But um, the uh, so that that lives. But the incremental uh, input uh, by way of, of uh, you know, angled increments and the like, I don't think that exists anymore. No. So all right. Sorry. No, 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 no. The, the, this the, this uh, Mars computer was just a, a proposal by uh, my team's instrumentation laboratory, and uh, it just didn't go any place on that. Okay, so that's number two. Uh, oh yes, the next uh, evolutionary dead end was the choice of one's complements uh, for as a number system. Uh, I'd love to hear of a uh, one's complements computer. I haven't one since then. By the way, in 1960, I was asked to review a paper from Poland in which somebody was touting a negative radix system, and uh, which, uh, you know, he had, he had some weird reason that this was uh, good for multiplication. But can you imagine you have the first bit is worth one, the next bit is worth minus two, and, <laughs> and you can make it work. That was the thing. Anyway, the one's complement. And I checked with Hugh because I've forgotten the why we had that. One's complement, uh, the property is that when you want to make the complement of a number or the negative of a number, you just invert all the bits. Whereas in the two's complements, you have to invert all the bits and then a single bit in the least significant place and it rattles all the way up. Now, the reason for using the one's complements is that, that with, with that, we only need a single instruction for both complementing logically and, and complementing numerically instead of having two, two instructions. Okay. So uh, now, there is, like everything else, a little bit of a downside. Uh, the downside is that with a one's complement system, you have two representations of zero, because the inverse of zero is still zero. And uh, well, uh, this, well, what's the big deal? It's not, you know, it's a 32,768, 32,767, what's the difference, except one? So um, the uh, thing was that when the computer was, I think it was by now at block two, uh, it was all assembled and was integrated uh, with the IMU and with the telescope done in the, in, in the integration laboratory where the famous spark business uh, uh, took place. Uh, we got, uh, Al Hopkins and I began to get reports that, you know, your computer's dropping pulses, something's happening. No, 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 you're doing something wrong. You know? So, so it, these guys didn't like being told they're doing something wrong. But pretty soon they came up and, and showed us, here, it's dropping pulses. So we went looking. And sure enough, it became evident that it was dropping exactly one pulse per day. Very mysterious. Now, I remember in what's happening, this computer is sitting there in the laboratory with an IMU, and, and uh, the IMU is active and is staying uh, stable with it relative to inertial space, but the Earth is rotating. So once a day, the complete circle of 200, you know, 2 to the 15th bits is supposed to take place and is supposed to uh, uh, kick over. But since the AGC was counting one pulse or less, whereas the IMU designers thought that well, the circle is divided into two or 15th parts, uh, but the AGC designers had arranged it so that it was divided into two or 15th minus one parts, you, you had a problem on that. So uh, my, my, when I heard about this, I thought, what's the big deal? No, there's a set of gears between the... Uh, uh, IMU and the place where the pulses are generated, and so we just change the gears and we fix everything, right, on that. So this was not well received at the time. <laughs> um, and, and, and especially because 2 to the 15th has is, is got lots of nice factors. Uh, they're small, but uh, 2 to the 15th minus 1 actually has, I, I wrote them down, 
is, is like 5, 31, and 157 are the only prime factors of, of let's see if I find it. Yeah, 7, 31, and 157 were the prime factors. And I thought that was actually good news because it could have been a Mersenne prime in which there would have been no prime factors. Uh, but no, I, I was once again uh, sort of uh, told that my way was perhaps not the way. And so Herb Thaler, who was a very, very, very smart man, one of the co-designers of the Apollo guidance computer, uh, found a way to fix the thing by just changing the wire wrap in the back plane. So no logic had to be changed in, 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 the, uh, uh, in, in the logic sticks. And I thought that, no, once again, that, that, was, that was super. Okay. Next uh, evolutionary dead end. The verbs and the nouns. Now that's a, a good story uh, because the way the lab was organized and the project was organized, well, Eldon has responsibility uh, for the logic design of the computer, but another group, uh, headed by Jim Nevins, had responsibility for human factors. And way at the beginning, there was all kinds of talk about this newfangled, you know, cathode ray tubes, we could have put something like that in. Uh, of course, very soon, uh, all the power consumption considerations made that uh, go away. So uh, the thing was that in Eldon's group, we wanted a way to show off the computer to visiting firemen. And we didn't have anything. And we were waiting for Jim to say uh, what was going to happen. So one day, coming into the lab, it occurs to me that you could make this some sense out of thing by saying a line, platform, fire, rocket, so you could have a numeric verb and a numeric noun. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, with Al Hopkins and Herb, and I, uh, we said, why don't we, why don't we uh, uh, do something like that temporarily while Jim Nevins and company figure out what to do? Now, uh, I, I thought, uh, Eldon, I don't remember, y you didn't object to it at the time that I can remember. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, anyhow, we did this, and uh, we were able to do it. By that time, Jim Nevins had already done a lot of good work. Uh, the buttons had to be this big, and the letters had to be this big, and the displays had to be this big, and, and we knew that they had to be uh, liquid crystal displays because they consumed little enough power and uh, latching relays and all of the technology that eventually could use in the real uh, uh, disky. But so we made a disky, and we had, uh, it would be a block one disky, uh, we had verbs and nouns and, and a couple of other register, mode register. And we began to show off the computer to um, uh, visiting firemen. And the thing was that pretty soon we got kind of into a pattern in which somebody would come up and would say, well, OK, it was very interesting, it was wonderful, but uh, what about this verb and noun? Uh, uh, are, are you going to leave it that way? He says, well, you know, it's not for us to leave it or not, but this is what we have while we show it off and while Jim Nevins thinks of what to do. So we thought that this was peculiar, and pretty soon, uh, we got to say, begin to push back and say, well, why, why, don't, you, why don't you want, the, uh, what, what's wrong with urban now? And so I wrote down some of the uh, reasons we were given at the time. It's not scientific. Can't do that. It's not military. Uh, I'll have another one so I won't forget. It's not serious. It's not dignified. <laughs> So we got pretty good at, at, at baiting people back. I said, well, you know, what would you, what would you suggest? Well, I don't know. Well, you know, we've got these restrictions. The letters have to be this big, and you've got to do this so that, you know, verb you might change to action, but noun, it'd be object of the action, and that won't fit, right? So, so we went into this thing, and we were really good at goading people, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and so people would, would get very frustrated. And the final one was, that uh, uh, a very senior member of the laboratory uh, came back. He had never gone to see the computer, and he was one of the major, major people programming uh, the thing. Uh, came up to see it uh, late in the program, and he went through the thing, and, and he too went to, so what's his verb and noun business? And, and uh, uh, we, we, so we went through the whole business of, of okay, what would you suggest, what would you put it, and what was your objection? And he really was pushing hard, and we pushed hard back. And his final, 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 absolutely, this is why we can't use it, is because the astronauts wouldn't understand it. <laughs> so, so, you know, th this was, so now years, years later, uh, I'm sitting at, at, uh, at the dedication of the Computer Museum, the Boston Computer Museum, I forget what it was called then. And, and the Computer Museum had chosen the AGC as the computer to start its 
life with. And Eldon gave a nice talk in which he talked about the, uh, what the computer was and had been. And then Dave Scott got up and talked about his experiences. And then at one point, Dave Scott says, and I don't know, Ed, I'm quoting him as best I can remember, and says, and I don't know who thought of that bourbon noun business, but it sure made life easy for us because we really could understand what was going on. So that was, <laughs> that was, that was a great vindication as far as I was concerned. Do you remember that? Uh, so, so. All right. All right. And the final thing that I think was an evolutionary dead end, which once again was what solved the problem, and uh, was Eldon's choice of a um, single logic uh, device to do the computer. Now, just to set the background, Al Hopkins and I had designed this, uh, well, what would become the AGC, but using something called core transistor logic, very dear to our hearts. Uh, and Eldon, who knew that this was not going to fly, uh, but, we, you know, he discussed it with us briefly, but we were not very cooperative at the time. He had hired Herb Thaler from Raytheon to go and explore MicroLogic. And at one point, Eldon decides that he's going to have to really uh, change the ground rules and, 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 and decide what to do. So I remember going with, with Al Hopkins to your office, and we were nervous, and you were nervous. And, <laughs> and what you announced that this core transistor logic isn't going to do it. And we went into all the reasons why absolutely we had to have this, and this was, you know, no way was it going to be possible to meet schedules or do anything. And then Eldon says, that's all very nice. It's not going to be core transistor logic. It's going to be micro logic. So um, Al Hopkins and I had a choice. We could either, you know, sort of hold our breath and pout and go away, or we can say, yes, sir, and go do it. So uh, we did, and uh, I think it was within three weeks we had it all redesigned for, for using, using MicroLogic. Now, uh, the reason I think it's an evolutionary dead end is because there is no computer alive today uh, that uh, uses a single logic type. But I am convinced that without the benefits of the, the power of the economies of scale, without being able to just buy them by the thousands without being able to have a single type that you really, really could uh, concentrate on and, and do uh, uh, proper uh, work in terms of reliability, that the Apollo probably would not have worked, at least would not have been as reliable. So, so those are my five things, which is like what, you know, like a, an ugly child that only a parent can love. You know, they, they, uh, uh, they can't see them anymore. So thank you very much. Thank you.